the governor's EMS and Trauma Advisory Council. I have checked the roll. We have two members missing so far. I understand one of them is on their way, so we'll get uh, get on with our agendas. I understand there's a another meeting going on that, that's kind of upstaging us, but we'll, we'll continue on as best we can here. Um, okay, let me find my... I think one of the things that, that we have been asked to do uh, at the beginning of every meeting is to, to uh, read the, the uh, mission statement uh, of GTAC. So I'm going to do that for you right now. The mission is to promote, develop, and maintain a comprehensive EMS trauma system that will meet the needs of all patients and that will raise the standards for community health care by implementing innovative techniques and systems for the delivery of emergency care for the entire population. So that's our purpose for being here today. We are going to make a few agenda changes because we've got uh, uh, some folks that actually need to go next door and, and or we're, I guess it's next door, the other meeting, um, having to do with the racks or something. Um, so with that being said, we will skip item number one right now and go to uh, item number two, uh, review of the model air medical state guidelines industry task force draft document regarding responsibility for patient care when flight crews are transporting in ground ambulances. There was some discussion on this uh, same thing in the EMS committee. Uh, we had a little bit of a discussion on it in our Thames meeting also. Um, and uh, Bert has, has a report for us. Okay. Um, we've met twice. We set this up to um, try and establish the questions that we need to ask for dishes and clarification. And so several people in this committee and then also members from the uh, medical directors committee, EMS committee, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, private sector of uh, air amb ambulances. Um, when we had our first teleconference, um, it was pretty apparent that we had more questions than uh, we had answers and we needed to find direction. Um, Stacy sent um, the Air Medical Services Future Development as an integrated component of the emergency medical services system that was put together by a task force from the National Associ Association of State EMS, National Association of EMS Physicians, and Association of Air Medical Services. We kind of used that as a guide on where we wanted to begin. Uh, we used that as a guide on where we wanted to begin. Uh, we met again yesterday, and we have come up with some draft questions that we'll be forwarding to DISHES. Uh, for clarification and then we'll move forward from there. We're going to meet today at 4 if anyone um, is interested in helping us draft some of those questions and the language that goes in those and they'll be upstairs um, in that little coffee shop area. And that's going to be at 4? At 4. Mm -hmm. And that's open to anybody that wants to, to participate? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bert. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. Um, and the one thing I neglected to mention um, is that our <laughs> little entertainment here. <laughs> well, at least it's not a G-rated or an X-rated. <laughs> Um, the one thing I failed to mention is that, that we do have the, um, the uh, live video streaming uh, courtesy of TTAP. So we have a clock up here in front of us so that we, we're sure to not go over our time. Um, and so be sure that it, when you're speaking, be sure and get uh, the microphone up close enough that, that it, it does go out through the broadcast so everybody can hear. Okay, the second item uh, on our agenda is to review the current DSHS EMS and trauma system rules published in Title 25 of the Chapter 157 and possible recommendations for changes additions to DSHS staff relative to the stroke and STEMI care. Uh, Jan, Cody, Deborah Wallace, do you have a report for us? Well, um, it's kind of the same that we had last time. We have uh, looked at these and said that you know we really don't see where these fit into the air medical rules um, that you know they may fit into the general rules and um, when the other committees look at those and 
see where those fit in, that we would look at those and support those. Um, but they don't really fit in, the definitions don't really fit into just the aeromedical okay. piece of it. Okay, thank you. If anybody has any comment at any time, uh, please raise your hand. I will ask you to come to the microphone. Uh, we don't have to wait for uh, general public comment. If you have comments or questions, uh, feel free to, to come up to the microphone. I would ask you to introduce yourself, um, but feel free to make your comments as we go along. Um, the third item on our agenda, and the one that's probably going to take the, the greatest body of time, um, is the status, oh no, I'm sorry, status of the MOA uh, for mutual aid uh, emergency medical services and disaster for air medical responders. I did have a note from Rick Bays that the MOAs were completed and that they were on the website. And I'm sure they're very easy to find, but I am not computer savvy enough or website savvy enough to find those on there. Um, so I'm sure they're on there. I'm gonna have to get with Rick. I, when I first got that message, I started looking for them, couldn't find them, forgot about it, and uh, haven't looked for them again. So I will find out where those are and, and make sure that everybody's aware of where those are. Um, And Alicia, we're going to put your, your presentation under general public comment because somehow it got left off of the agenda. Um, but the thing we wanted to do um, that we've been working on for a little while is to um, compare the new model state guidelines uh, or the proposed model state guidelines to um, what we had sent for proposed air medical rules a, a while back. Alicia's been doing uh, a comparison of those. Um, so. She's going to have the information for us. Uh, we'll have it up on the up on the screen, and as soon as, as Alicia gets hobbled over there and settled in, then we'll let her start on that presentation. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Shirley. Is this close enough that everybody can hear me? Yes. Nods from the back. Wonderful. Um, the model state guidelines actually. Jack in the room. Okay, Jack, can you come up and actually give us some history? Um, Jack spearheaded this project at the national level, um, and he can give us a little bit of foundation of, of why we're doing this gap analysis or, or what the model state guidelines are, and then I'll give you the foundation of why we did this. All right, um, the model state guidelines project was started um, over a year ago, um, actually with a group through the Association of Air Medical Services and with several other associations within the industry. Um, what the goal of the group was to come up with a basic set of what was recommended to be within um, regulations regarding air medical services. It was to, it, it sets that minimum level. It was not really ever intended to be, um, you know, a, greatly above and beyond what's, you know, this state has a lot of items already in place. Some states have absolutely nothing. So we were trying to come up with at least a beginning point of what we thought should be in a draft rule within the state guidelines. Um, so where that is currently is the final paper is done, so it's out, I'm the chair of the standards committee for the Association of Air Medical Services. It's out of standards committee and actually back with the executive group within the association. Um, they are deciding now, hopefully reviewing it this week, as to what they're going to do with that, if they're going to put it out to all the AIMS members for additional comments or if they're gonna just go ahead and draft a white paper off of that and put that white paper out there for comments. Um, the original intent was for that white paper to go back to NACIMSO, would be presented back to them um, to be put in regulatory language. Um, they had an individual um, set to do that, and I believe that is still, um, depending on what the executive group of AIMS decides, still where that document's gonna go um, when they're eventually done with it. NACIMSO would then agree to adopt part of it, not adopt it. It would be in their final language. They would present that to the state uh, EMS directors um, for states to adopt or not adopt. It would still be up to them as to whether or not they wanted to use the guidelines or not. And that's how we got to the document where we're at today. Okay. The document that uh, we utilized was the May final draft that was sent, not the February draft, for those of you who have multiple drafts hanging around. Um, and what we were really looking at, um, Stacy, myself, and Jim sat down. Thank you very much, Jack. Stacy, myself, uh, Jim sat down and really uh, 
went through everything. Um, there were a lot of areas that we were uh, much more inclusive. You know, we took, uh, covered all of the bases that were covered within that, those guidelines that have been put out, um, plus more. Uh, there were a few areas where um, we did not address things or um, uh, we went through and, and decided it wasn't to be addressed in the draft rule that was proposed by us. But um, when we did this gap analysis, basically we were looking at what we did not address specifically that the model state guidelines did. Um, there were some things that we addressed that were not even covered or touched in the model site guidelines. And we didn't, we didn't compile that list for you. We're just looking at what we, we possibly could address within, within the draft rule that has already been uh, formulated by this committee and by stakeholders. Um, and what I started with was basically how our draft rule 157, 12, and 13 that we came up with, how it was broken down. Um, and then went through and found the different sections because the model state guidelines obviously broken down a little bit differently um, to, to piece it all together. So in the administrative section of uh, the draft rule put forth by this committee, um, it basically has some initial renewal application standards. Um, and we were basically more uh, inclusive in, in what we had put forth in our draft. Um, and we also defined an appeal process as well above and beyond. Uh, and the second section that we put forth was uh, regarding hiring and credentialing. Um, and we found that we were, again, more inclusive, um, including some inter-rater reliability stuff, things like that. So there was nothing that, that was put forth that was less than uh, what the model state guidelines had come through. The professional development programs uh, was our section C. Um, and it also is uh, in 157.11 as well, addressed in 157.11. Um, our 157.12 does not address some s small education pieces, things like that, like crash recovery education and um, a few details about keeping records of initial and recurrent training. So you may want to go back and revisit that, that we may want to address those within our document. Um, protocol administration. At any time, if anybody has any questions or if I'm going too fast or if I'm confusing, please let me know. <laughs> um, in the protocol administration and oversight section, um, 157 did not um, address a review timeline for um, reviewing your, your protocols. Uh, excuse me, 157.12 did not. Um, and that was the only gap that there was there. Um, operational standards. Um, we were not as detailed on some of the QI parameters, um, high and low temperatures within the aircraft, things like that, that we may want to go back and revisit. There were, there were some very detailed standards in there regarding, I believe, like 50 degrees to 95 degrees and some patient parameters and what you should monitor and everything else. Um, but we were more inclusive regarding duty time and rest and fitness for duty, things like that, that were addressed by us. Um, in the program administrative oversight section, um, that was broken down. There were many different areas for that one as well as operational standards that, that came from the model state guidelines. Um, and the only thing that we, we found that we were uh, missing or did not address was just culture, the actual term of just culture and, and adding that in there. Uh, communication section was extensive for the model state guidelines. It was probably the longest um, section within there, their communication um, center standards. Um, so basically there were, there were drills, there were um, an extensive section on uh, in emergency incident plans and what you have to document and how long you have to keep it. And I, I think to go through each one of those things that we, we did not address would be a little bit um, overkill right now, but probably just the whole section needs to be revisited if we wanted to be that detailed um, within ours. Um, the work environment uh, section, we were inclusive of all the standards and then again we had a little bit more about the MSDS, FOD recognition, uh, education, things like that and adequate crew quarters. Um, the safety section, um, we were inclusive of all the standards listed there and um, extensively more inclusive regarding safety management systems. So um, 
we had quite a bit lined out regarding safety, safety management and fitness for, for duty, as well as appropriate clothing. In the quality, manage, quality improvement section, excuse me, it was listed as the quality management program within the model site guidelines, and we were inclusive of everything that was in there um, and had a little bit more detail on some stuff. The medical director's qualifications was our section. Medical control was the model state guidelines section. Um, there were some details in there regarding the medical director ensuring EMTALA compliance and inner facilities and some, some details that might need to be um, uh, revisited, especially about destination determination and having specific policies for that and transfer of care policies. I mean, those two sections seem you know, very detailed. Um, that ours did not, did not address in such a detail. And then the failure to meet standards, that's more of a state thing, what happens if you didn't do it all? Um, and it was obviously not addressed because that would be a state level operation. Uh, when we went back through, after we had compared everything in our document and tried to find it uh, in the other document and see how, how we measured up, uh, we went back through and said, was there anything we just didn't even touch on, any sections? Um, we, in our uh, 157.12, we did not have a definition or acronym section. And I know it's covered in other areas, but we probably need to revisit that as part of 157.12. Um, there were some personal and professional liability insurance requirements in the model state guidelines that we did not put in there. We talked about airframe insurance and FAA compliance and things like that, but not about personal or professional liability. Um, Subscription plans, I thought it was interesting and I had to quote it that the, if you were gonna sell subscription that you had to list on your subscription the most medically appropriate provider when you sold that subscription. So there was some details on the subscription rules that we'd have to probably visit with with the state and see what their views are on that, things like that. Um, they also had a section requiring demonstration of financial resources of the air medical provider when you renewed your license. Do you have enough money to run this business? basically. Um, there were some patient privacy considerations, HIPAA type stuff that was written in there that's probably covered in other sections of rule, but we just have to revisit and make sure that they were in line. Um, they had a very uh, access to, uh, detailed access to services uh, clause within there. Um, when you're available, how far you are, your defined area, things like that. Um, they recommended a frequency of review of standards like uh, we did with 157.12 every uh, seven years at least. Um, they have an entire page actually dedicated to the circumstances in which one team member could transport with the patient and leave the other team member behind. Um, and they gave specific examples of when that might happen, mass casualty situations type thing. Um, their medical equipment list included uh, requiring a ventilator, required end tidal CO2, so we probably just need to break that down with what's in 157.11 regarding equipment. Um, and I, I know there was a few things in there I know that were not in 157 that were very specific. Um, 157.12 needs to address the new 95th percentile, which is correct within the model state guidelines. Um, the weight of America is going up, just in case <laughs> anybody hadn't seen that yet. Um, there is a section there that requires you to have a policy regarding bariatric patients um, that we did not address and how, how you are going to address that if you cannot fit the patient into your helicopter safely. Um, there was a section in there about um, guidelines on transporting multiple patients and we, we do not have anything in a rule right now regarding multiple patient transports. Um, and then they also recommended the integration of national NIMS, ICS classes 100 and 200 for all personnel, and then if you are part of any sort of state or national response plan to also have 800. So that was kind of where we were um, when looking back and forth. There may have been a few other small things that, that we missed, and please feel free if you are aware of the document and um, and think that we might have missed something to, to let us know. But all in all, I think um, our document was as inclusive or more inclusive. Um, there may be some things that we want to go back and address. 
Um, again, this was the draft that is going to become another paper, so we don't know what that new paper is going to look like, and we may just end up watching it until we have a, a more solidified document to go, go by, but that's kind of where we're at right now as a pulse check. Jack? Uh, one more quick thing. Um, at our last meeting, um, there was a discussion of actually sending the paper through DOT for approval. Um, just to make sure there wasn't anything preempted in there that we couldn't require. So if the final paper goes through that process, I don't know DOT's timeline. So um, that we are trying to get that done to at least get their buy-in for the state guidelines. So. Any idea when they'll make that decision as to whether to send it through DOT or, or no? No, it, it was just discussed at the last board meeting for Ames. Um, Tim was here yesterday. He actually had a conference call with Rick, the new president and CEO. He said that we've had some new bylaw changes that came out, and he's been sidetracked with that, and this is the next thing at the top of his list. He needs to come up to speed on that. I volunteered to go to D.C. to meet with him to, to bring him up to speed on what we've done so far. Um, I, I think the staff will probably take it back at this point, put it into more of a true white paper form, send that out potentially to the AIMS board or the AIMS membership for um, comments and then from there I, I think is when they would send it off so I, I would say they could have it done you know middle of um, September I believe okay is my best guess so possibly then at the AMTC we'll have some information on on exactly what they're going to do with that or I, I think you'll see substantial progress between now and AMTC okay of this moving forward. okay and and for any of you that that don't know when AMTC is going to be mid-October, uh, so that's not too terribly far down the road. So a couple months. Uh, so maybe we'll have some some uh, further information by then. Alicia, thank you so much for for putting that together. I think it's interesting. It, it, just looking at the um, the model state guidelines, looking at the things that are addressed on there, and 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 maybe the way that they're they're addressed um, in the draft looks an awful lot like um, some other guidelines that we've seen or some standards that we've seen uh, other places so I think it's it's very interesting and you know I I can on one hand I guess I'm gonna offer my opinion here maybe I shouldn't but I think that's probably a good idea because you know we don't need 14 organizations telling us 14 different ways that we should be doing things um, and the only way that we're going to make things better is to have some agreement between the, the different organizations and, and between the, 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 the states and the governing bodies of the states, uh, the, the uh, other organizations, having some agreement between those that, yes, this is the right way to do things. Um, so I don't think we'll get better having conflicting ideas uh, forever. And, yeah, there's some things that maybe I don't agree with, maybe you don't agree with, but... I think at the end of the day, you know, our interest is, is to make things better for everybody, make things, um, the patient care part of what we do at least um, uh, as good as we can make it. You know, there's other agencies that take care of the, the flight issues and, and those, those rules and regulations, but, you know, the things that we can't have a say in, I think it's important that we do. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised to see, I mean, I, we all know that the 95th percent percentile has increased uh, because we are, as a country, getting heavier. Uh, we're not getting taller, but we are getting heavier. Um, it's going to be interesting to see what the consensus is on the... Um, um, the guidelines for the, uh, the, the bariatric patients. Uh, what do you do with those patients that don't fit in your aircraft, uh, and how do you take care of those? Another one that I think is, is interesting, especially maybe not so much for the helicopter programs, but for maybe the fixed wing programs, or some of them for the helicopter programs on the subscription programs, the, the name of the most medically appropriate provider. I think that's, that's a little odd piece in there. I want to be careful that we watch and see what happens with that. Anybody have any other comments on, on these? Uh, on the gap analysis. 
So we'll watch and see what happens with it. Um, and like Jack said, maybe we'll have some information uh, by, by the uh, AMTC uh, mid-October. And then, uh, of course, our, our next meeting will be in November. We can, we can bring that back maybe and, and uh, see what we, what we want to do and what we need to do with all of that. So again, thank you um, for those of you that worked on the gap analysis. Um, we are open for general public comment. Um, Jack, would you like, oh, come ahead, Brock. No, come ahead. Good afternoon, Brock Miller with Air Medical. On behalf of Thames, Texas Association of Air Medical Services, we want to invite everybody out Friday, November 9th at Onion Creek Country Club for the second annual Texas CMS Hall of Honor annual golf tournament. All proceeds will go to the Texas CMS Hall of Honor which uh, gives financial assistance to the family members who have lost a loved one in the AMS line of duty. It's a 1,300 uh, shotgun start, 125 per person or 400 to force them. And if you don't play golf, you can still join us for a dinner and that's $40 per person. You can register at tames.org, T-A-A-M-S.org. If you have any questions, you can send them directly to texasames at gmail.com. Now the funds, that are raised um, through the golf tournament are specifically to help with the travel, travel. for those families so that they can, so they attend, can attend the conference and the ceremony. Correct. So I, under, I didn't get to go to the, the golf tournament last year. Um, I understand it was a lot of fun. As we had a great turnout, a lot of sponsorship uh, there. We even had Audi of North Austin donate an Audi A4 for a hole in one, and we're trying to get them uh, this year as well. So if you're a scratch golf, or bring your game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We do have some save the date flyers. Yeah, is out, that correct? Out front. And out front. If, oh, Jim has them right here. Okay, we have and them both places. And if there's some places. left over, people can take them to their place of business and maybe post them in bright flank break rooms or something. Thank you very much. And if you're interested in doing a sponsorship, see Brock. We take all all of those we can get. Thank you. Um, there will also be a silent auction um, and some other other fun things going on. Thanks, Brock. Briefly on the silent auction, uh, we're asking anybody out there who's willing to donate a silent auction item, or item to uh, you can get in contact with me or any one of the members and they can get in contact with me. Um, we're going to do something a little different this year with the help of DISH. We're going to be able, we're going to have two tables or two booths set up with all the silent auction items at the exhibit hall this year so we'll give everybody in the conference an opportunity to bid and sign up on those so we're, we're soliciting silent auction items whether that's a basket i know last year we had uh, anywhere from uh, massages at some of these high-end resorts around here to wine baskets to uh, items from individual organizations that were put together so anything we can get together for that to help benefit this we would appreciate it all right thanks Jim um, Jack says we president of Thames also the Ames regional director person um, just a couple things that we met had in our meeting this morning um, we did talk about the out-of-state providers and how that impacts the ground folks um, we're going to just going to monitor to that situation. You know, all the members of Thames are obviously have a license within the state, so we're going to look at that and just see how that progresses and see what happens as that moves forward and see what those issues are. Um, and as Bert works on the questions, you know, we'll we'll help with that and just see if we need to do anything as that as that works through the system. Um, we also did talk about two recent incidents that have happened um, within our state um, in our industry in the last few weeks. You know, we looked at some CISD options and what the resources are for the state um, for when stuff like that happens. So we have a better idea of what is available out there and if there's an opportunity for us to go and provide some of that as well as, a, as an organization. So we'll look at that. And we also reemphasize the use of crew resource management. Um, and some of the folks that were, had knowledge of those incidents talked about how CRM actually helped um, with those incidents as they happened. So just an update for You want to do um, an Ames report also? Um, I can. Um, switching hats again. Um, 
for the Ames report, um, Cheryl talked about AMTC that is in October um, in um, Seattle. Seattle. Sorry, I can't remember where it was. Um, so online registration is open. Hotels are open, so you can sign up online. Um, the registration is actually being outsourced this year. It actually frees up some of the AIM staff to um, do some other tasks involved with the conference. Um, if you're an AIM member, you've got some bylaw changes that are being recommended by Rick, the president and CEO. Um, those should have come to you yesterday, so that whoever your voting member is should have those now. They involve a few things, such as uh, being able to vote online, being able to do um, some co phone conference stuff, just how how the board can meet to make it a little bit easier. Um, it also, within those bylaws, there's some changes about the title for, I think everybody knows Tim that usually comes here to the meeting. Um, he's officially now listed as president of Ames. That title will change to chair, and Rick will be the new president, CEO of the organization. You'll see him more as a public figure instead of the recurring president that changes every time it's elected within the board. Um, the other thing, we had a strategic planning meeting in Denver last month, and Senate Bill 2376 was out there. Um, you should have gotten some documentation on it. Um, it was a unanimous decision of the board to oppose that legislation just the way it's written. Um, we got a legal opinion on it, and that legal opinion came back and just said it was going to create more confusion for what it was trying to settle with uh, what states could and could not do, and it re would result in an amendment to the ADA. Um, so at the time, the board, you know, because the bill has already been filed, where our only two options were either to support it or oppose it, just because it, we, we couldn't go back and change it at that point. Um, so the decision was made to oppose that. Um, we did talk about in Thames um, being able to go back and look at the pieces that we did like and submit a letter back to AIM saying we, we, we like this part of it and, you know, be able to support those pieces and maybe look at future legislation and propose bills to include those pieces. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody have anything else for general public comment? No other words of wisdom, opinions, Anything else? Okay, then uh, we'll continue on down the agenda. So our, our um, uh, summary for our GTAC meeting will um, certainly include the, uh, um, one of the things I am gonna do is find out where the, the MOAs are since I can't find them. Um, but we will talk uh, uh, that we are going to the there were going to be some questions drafted uh, to send to dishes, um, uh, basically trying to uh, get the the answer get the answers to the questions that we have specifically um, regarding uh, patient care when flight crews are transporting in an ambulance. Um, the MOAs, the um, and then the uh, model state guidelines, the gap analysis, just uh, some some brief points in there, and the fact that you know our our proposed rules pretty much align with um, the draft um, model state guidelines. We do have some areas in there where ours are more definitive or, or more in depth. Um, and then some areas that um, we didn't cover in our in our proposed rules. Uh, so we'll be um, looking to see what we need to do with those, uh, and and watching the um, the uh, guidelines for um, when they come out. Um, our next meeting will be at the state conference. And I don't have the exact date and time that we're going to meet, um, and that's subject to change at this point anyway. So um, I would encourage you to attend if you can. Uh, the uh, committee meetings typically are on Saturday and Sunday before the conference starts on Monday. And then the GTAC council meeting typically is on Monday evening. So that'll give you a little bit of a, an idea of, of when you might expect us 
uh, to be meeting. Uh, anybody have anything else? Yes, sir. Sure. It's just an, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I can tell you the, the case where you might uh, get into that uh, scenario, um, you might or might not, um, but if you were to respond, uh, especially in a helicopter, to a scene uh, where you have a helicopter full of fuel, you've got uh, your density altitude is, is way up there, you've got a, a fair-sized crew, and then you've got a big patient uh, so that you cannot uh, take both crew members and get off the ground with them. Um, and so do you have uh, uh, the, the option of leaving one crew member on the ground, taking the patient with one crew member? Go ahead, Alicia. Yeah, uh, and it does mention that these circumstances should be uh, infrequent conditions. Um, but the first one they list is um, the conditions of density, altitude, and weight, um, and um, that the policy that you write regarding that condition um, supports the pilot's authority to make the decision. The second one is a single medical attendant should have knowledge and medical equipment to adequate care for the patient. Um, the decision to transport with only one attendant should require uh, medical control, uh, physician approval, the, and then it, it talks about quality management for it, um, and that you have no other transport team available that could do the flight um, in the appropriate time with the level of care, um, and that you should have to report these events anytime they happen to the state. So the only time, and, and somewhere in here, it's a full page, but somewhere in here it did list the, the mass casualty type situation, um, but I think really they're looking at the whole density, altitude, and weight. You know, do you drop your equipment and then possibly not have your equipment that you need, or do you drop a crew member? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Anything else? Okay, if no one has anything else, then we are adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>